Okay, so I want to dig a little bit deeper into how grids are used and what they mean and don't mean. And I have here uh, uh, what we're working on currently is uh, just a page of text. And a page like this is very gray. It just shows the margins. Uh, it's not very interesting. I use Greeking for this uh, because I'm thoroughly of the do as I say, not as I do school, but this will be fine for demonstration purposes. And we're going to look at some grids and how they're used legally. And again, the grid is just the text area. Any pictures, uh, art credits, uh, folios, and some of the pages I showed you in the brief section had stuff that was like entire stories contained in the margin, if, they, if the margins are big enough. And uh, uh, that can be done. And there's a term for stuff that's in the margin of a magazine or a book, which is just marginella. And... Uh, and things can be in the margins because your grid is not your uh, is, is where you choose as a designer to keep your live text. And we talked about some of those decisions that can make a magazine feel more airy or less airy or tighter and newsier uh, or more designerly and more open. And I'm not going to revisit those here, but you can review that video if you want. Um, because that's because a grid is is a decision, and uh, if you're sending a job to press, there's also what a page would call a, a a printer would probably call the safe area, and that's approximately this line here. Uh, that is where it becomes dangerous to go too close to the edge with little type because you're risking it getting cut off. And these magazines we're working on this semester won't actually go to press for the most part, but uh, uh, it's good to know for future reference that that's what you have to deal with. And the reason for that is because a magazine press, just like most of the printers you're familiar with, cannot print to the absolute edge of the paper. Uh, it cuts off a little bit before the edge. So if you see a illustration or a photograph or anything or a headline, anything else seemed to go off the page, off the edge. It's what happened was, is that page was printed. Uh, it came off the press and then it was assembled into a booklet. And then the booklet was uh, cut down to size. And if you look at a magazine or a book, paperback book, you'll see that it has a nice even edge. And if you think about uh, if you made a booklet uh, at home and you just stacked up a bunch of uh, pages, it would start to pop out in the middle a little bit. It would start to bump, create a bump in the middle, and that bump would get worse and worse if the thicker your your booklet was because uh, your pages are stacked on top of each other, but they're also stacked at the spine. And so uh, there's always a risk if you get too close to the edge. This is sort of where you can't go, and this is where you choose to go is the difference between those two. Now, the converse of that is if you uh, print to the edge, if you want your picture to print to the edge, uh, it actually has to go a little bit beyond. And this is uh, uh, a page with what are called crop marks and bleed marks. Uh, these inner ones, this is the bleed mark. Uh, the crop mark is showing where the printer is supposed to cut that page. And most printers do a pretty good job at that, but it's uh, it's not always uh, perfect, so you have to be a little bit sensible. The other feature of this is uh, a registration mark, and that just helps the uh, printer put all of the plates, because this is going to be just like your home printer, CMYK, on press. It helps the uh, printer target those plates so that they all end up in the right place. And so, this is a choice, this is a design decision, and I know that at this point it seems like a trivial design decision, but it also has a, but it really has a big impact on how your pages are perceived. So I'm gonna go through a bunch of examples of, of sort of unfortunate and fortunate grid use and what, uh, what working with a grid means and doesn't mean. And uh, it's important if you have a grid that you are using it. I've had students design pages and you know they say, I have a grid, there's a grid, I'm using a grid, but they're not using a grid because there's no relationship between what they're doing with the text and what the grid structure of the page underneath it does. There's also, uh, even if you have a grid, you have to be a little bit careful. And in design, 
uh, makes it, uh, well, it makes it both easy to get it right and easy to get it wrong. So for example, uh, if I'm linking my text frames and I click, uh, if I click pretty accurately, that text frame when InDesign renders it, it's going to be perfectly on grid. But if I'm off enough, InDesign will think, well, that's where you want it to be. That's where you want the grid to be. You don't want it, the box to be. You don't want it to be quite on grid. And so something like this can happen really easily by accident. And in this case, InDesign makes it the right size and the right height. It knows there's a grid, but it doesn't put it in the right place. So that's just something to look out for. And so my red is just like, I'll be using red and green on the left, just to indicate uh, bad and good, and showing you the page without the distractions on the right, so you can see what it is. And you can see that we see this just doesn't quite line up above, and we also have this gutter that's a little bit uneven. And it just makes that page, you know, these start things start to add up. Maybe you wouldn't miss it, you wouldn't notice it once, but they combine to make the page feel uh, uh, unprofessional. They, they combine over time to sort of undermine the professional and the authority of that magazine. And that's what magazine is selling. They're, they're saying, you, we want you to be a, we, we want to be a trustworthy source. We want you to come to this magazine for information you can trust. And if it's a little bit haphazard, um, even with the design, that can start to undermine that trust. The reader might not even notice that, uh, but they'll just feel that it's a little bit off. So as I said in the lecture on grids in general, the grid is really just for your text. Uh, depending on how you choose to make your grid and how you choose to use it, other things can go off, and that includes your picture, which can certainly bleed off the edge as it does here. Um, this one is almost, you get away with it. We have a small headline. It seems like uh, uh, it's lining up almost with the X height of these letters, but if you look at the page, it looks eh, just not quite right. I would have been inclined to make that, that type on grid. I would have been inclined to line up the headline uh, uh, with the top column of text, and that might have had some disadvantages too, but a lot of times typography is about compromise. You have to decide which uh, not quite right you like better, and I think in this case, I at least would like it lined up with the cap height rather than the X height. Now, headlines themselves, when they get really big, and everyone's going to design at least one feature story, which will probably have a big headline in this class, uh, you can treat headlines like art. Um, there's, uh, this is technically text, but it's not small text. It's not running text. And so if you want to take that headline off the page, out of the margins, that is perfectly fine and perfectly legal because, and I wish I'd kern that N and E pair a little bit better, uh, but because um, even though this cuts off, it's big enough that we can s clearly see what that letter is, even if it cut off a little bit more. And the H we definitely can see because uh, that could be nothing else. And the E we would have to be down to like that. Uh, you know, just a little bit of edge before we'd be wondering whether it's an E or a C or, or what have you. And uh, and your printer would be reprinting the job if they screwed up the cropping that bad because they'd be also cropping off some of this text. Uh, so th that treating type when it gets big like art, taking it off the page, perfectly fine, so long as your little text is within the structure of that page. Um, Something I see pretty commonly is something that looks like a three column grid. Here we have this column that's a little bit skinnier. This one's right, this one's a little bit big. The gutters are a little bit off too. It just undermines the credibility of that information and the professionalism of that page. So I've talked in the previous lecture about using columns as units, thinking about columns as units, and I also talked about how, and this would be optional in this case, I would say I would keep these columns regular, but if you wanted to use that grid for something like a text wrap, uh, you know, why not? It just keeps your decisions a little bit consistent with each other and a little bit on rhythm. I sometimes describe grids as being like, uh, like the rhythm in music. You know, you can have a basic 4-4 beat, and on top of that you could have jazz, and on top of that, you can have classical music. Uh, the rhythm of the grid doesn't really limit what you can do. It just actually makes it easier and faster to do what you want to do. Um, then we get into medium headlines, which can be a little bit ambiguous. And just a reminder, my signage is outside of my grid. 
my grid is for designing the page and my margin is for the pages essentially furniture like the signage and so this is a time a case where i would say i kind of trumps grid um, we have this medium headline and we also have a rounded character like the letter E and maybe even actually I think I moved, wished I'd moved those in a little bit more in this case. But uh, but that rounded E because it's a rounded character, it's not a straight hard line. It actually looks like it's lining up with the column below it. And you can look at that there when in fact it is not quite lining up because it's a rounded character. It has just less visual weight. And so it often pays to take something, you know, in cases like that, just slightly off grid. So you get the look of alignment, even if, uh, uh, even if you uh, uh, are not literally aligned. So just another example of, uh, of uh, 12 being used as a three. So I think I'm repeating that page. Oh, and then let's also look at this page. Uh, so we have here another perfectly legal situation, which is that we are using a 12, and this is obviously just one running text, but if we imagined one article ending above this headline and another article starting below it, uh, it would be perfectly fine to switch your grid structure uh, for that other article. And it might also be fine, desirable to help visually distinguish them. If I was going to do that for a live page, uh, I would probably also, uh, every magazine that I've worked with has a primary body, which has generally been a serif, and a secondary body, which has generally been a sans serif, and I might switch to my secondary body uh, for this story below to further underline that these are different things. And this spacing is, I'm painfully aware, way too tight. I should have given a little bit more room for that headline, uh, a little bit more buffer around it. But uh, the point is still sound that uh, uh, there can be multiple grids on a page provided they're compatible with each other. And your magazine will still, still seem professional and, and perfectly reasonable. Uh, and then 12 column grid. Uh, a way not to use it, at least within one article, would be to just sort of randomize how wide each columns are. So we have a 12 column grid. This is all technically on grid, but it just seems like a little bit of a confusing page. I mean, it's, it's a reader might say, why is this one narrow? Why is this one thick? Why is this one somewhere in between the two? You might as well, you know, underline that this is all part of a single text by making those columns the same width. Again, if they were not part of the same text, there's no reason not to change them up if you have a reason to do it. But if they are, uh, uh, you might as well keep them the same because this just looks a little bit funky, even though it is technically on this 12 column grid. Now, it was very fashionable, I would say seven or eight years ago, maybe a little bit more, to create a rhythm with columns. So, for example, there'd be a uh, like a three column or, uh, or maybe a four unit or a five unit column on one side and a seven unit on the other. And then the other page, the page it was next to would be a mirror of that. So you'd have, uh, so essentially you'd have pages that would go thin, thick, thick, thin, spreads that would go thin, thick, thick, thin. And uh, that can be an effective way of designing, but just sort of a random approach to column widths is probably not a good idea. And uh, I talked about this in the previous video, but there's no reason not to use your grid to incorporate a little bit of white space if you want to. Uh, I actually don't love this page, but it is a perfect legitim legitimate use of grid to have uh, a, a one column buffer. And in this case, that does enforce the, the difference also with the type distinct distinction, which makes it a little bit easier uh, for the reader. And note that in terms of hierarchy with this one, you can make your primary story doesn't always have to be. We think of ourselves as people who read upper left to bottom right. Uh, but here, no one would question that this is the most important story on the page, even though this is one at the upper left. Uh, we read that way, but in reality, people take in pages, they tend to go from biggest to smallest as they navigate around the page. And that's a nice tool for designers to bear in mind so that they don't always have to, you know, structure their pages exactly the same way.